Hey kids, let's talk about the good old days growing up in Idaho. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Growing Up in Idaho. Today is Father's Day, and so happy Father's Day to everyone out there who is a father or who hopes to become one. And on Father's Day, just about like every other day of the year, I think about my dad in one way or another. And a lot of the thoughts that I have of dad are, um, aside from the current things that are going on in his life that I know of, the fact that he's retired and, and uh, spends all of his days with my mother and traveling and, and doing things that he enjoys. I think of growing up in his home and uh, some of the experiences I had. And as, along with thinking of my own father, uh, I think of my grandfather and um, some of the generations back. And uh, so on this little podcast today, I'd like to talk about my own ancestry as far as the fathers went and uh, talk a little bit about some of the things that I know about my grandfathers and um, some of the memories I have and experiences uh, growing up and, and as an adult. So uh, I came from a fairly um, proud, I guess you would say proud family of Hicks men. Uh, Robert Hicks, who was born in the eight, early 1800s, or about the mid-1800s, actually, uh, grew up in eastern Kansas on a farm. And um, when he and his wife were young and had about one or two kids, for whatever reason, they decided to move west, along with a lot of the other people that were heading west in those days. And the story is that they were looking for the uh, for a new life in the famed wheat fields of whatever um, state or territory they they wanted to go to. Which it's my understanding they wanted to end up in Washington State, what is now Washington. Anyway, they headed west and had some experiences along the way, and finally found themselves in in Idaho. Uh, right there in the the big Camas Prairie, and they lived in caves for the first year of their time there until they were able to get cabins built, and they claimed their land. My my grandmother, great great grandmother, uh, claimed her piece, and Robert claimed his piece, and um, that's where my great grandfather Victor Hicks grew up. He's Robert's and Anna's son. And uh, Victor was a teamster in central Idaho and had a big team of horses and, and worked those horses in all the mining camps around that area, which included mines in, in and around Chalice and Salmon and Pasimeroy and, um, and Yellow Jacket. And so my grandfather, Harry Hicks, grew up uh, as as a kid in yellow jacket and in salmon and in Pissimeroy. And all of the experiences that he wrote about in his life history come from that area uh, as a kid. And um, life was interesting. For example, uh, when Harry was about eight or nine years old, the family moved to yellow jacket and Harry set up a little business of his own watching the smokes for the the men who were at the dance hall on Friday nights and Saturday nights there in Yellow Jacket. And he would uh, charge those miners so much money for every time he had to watch their, their smokes. Because apparently you couldn't smoke inside the dance hall. So they'd go out on that, uh, on a big porch along the, the hall there and, uh, smoke and he would watch them while they were went back in anyway that that was his his way of making money and also apparently from what i understand he made his own 
cigars and would sell them. And a lot of the cigars he made from, from the old uh, stogies that he would find uh, around there. Take the, the uh, tobacco out of them and, and, and roll his own out of his own sugar paper. Anyway, he talks about that in his life history. It's really interesting. So when my dad came along in 1942, the year he was born, uh, World War II was in full progress. And uh, Grandpa Hicks um, was not fighting in that war uh, because he had a heart murmur. So he, he fought the war or supported the war effort by just working and, uh, and, and doing all he could to help from the home front. And um, so my dad grew up with his dad as a hard rock miner in all of the mining camps around central Idaho. And um, much of that time spent in, in cobalt as a young kid and then growing up in salmon. And incidentally, it might be interesting for you to know that Harry claims that he was the first actual miner. And we're talking about a guy who, who understood mining and, and blasting and how to extract ore from the dirt. So he was the first miner in cobalt in the Blackbird mine. And, uh, and that's kind of an interesting side story we might talk about at some other time. So um, my dad grew up in salmon and, and, like I said, spent a lot of time in cobalt. In fact, he had his own car when he was 12 or 13 years old and on the weekends would drive over to cobalt to work in his brother-in-law, uh, in his brother-in-law's gas station. His brother-in-law was Carol Jarvis. Some of you may remember Carol, some of you old timers. Anyway, dad um, had a lot of experiences growing up there in Salmon, and he talks about those a lot. And, and we've recorded some of those stories, and we will do more as time goes on. But I want to talk uh, about my dad and concentrate on, on some of his experiences and stories. Uh, you have to know growing up in mining camps as a kid was not easy. But there were a lot of adventures and things that went on that dad has talked about all the years that I've been alive. For example... When he was a little three or four year old kid, the miners thought it was funny to gather those little kids together whenever it was possible and teach them swear words. And they didn't just teach them the words, they paid them a nickel for every time they could say a swear word really well. So as you can imagine, dad grew up with a swearing habit that he picked up from those days of, of uh, being taught by the miners and being rewarded. Dad probably had more pocket change than his own dad because of his uh, swearing. So when I was a kid, dad swore. And, uh, and to his credit, um, I've watched him grow up in a lot of ways, uh, because I was one of the oldest kids in the family. And, and dad, through all the years that I've been alive, I've noticed that he's, he's overcome that habit of swearing as a religious individual. And as an educator, he didn't want to, uh, to be swearing all the time. So, um, when I came along in 1964, dad was a policeman or soon to be a policeman there in Boise, Idaho. And he and mom moved there uh, a couple of years before I came along so that dad could go to school. Now that's another interesting uh, tale. None of the Hicks people ever went to college. In fact, most of the men 
that grew up in the family uh, didn't even finish high school. They left high school at 16 or 17 and went out and worked and started earning a living. So dad was actually, as far as the immediate family and his family, was the first one that finished high school. And, uh, and definitely the first one that went to college. And we can credit my mother for a lot of that because she had high expectations. And uh, by extension, dad had high expectations. So he went to college and, and enrolled there at Boise State College, as it was called at the time. And to support the family, he became a, a deputy sheriff for Ada County. And so he drove the streets working night shift, uh, patrolling the county uh, at night. And for all the kids who grew up in Salmon and had dad as a teacher, uh, remember all the police stories and all of the things that he uh, experienced as a police officer. And there's some wild and wooly stories that he had. And some of them uh, we've recorded and, and, and you can find on, on the podcast apps under Growing Up in Idaho, if you're looking for them. So uh, dad wanted to become an educator. I don't know why. It wasn't for the pay. But I think that he had, in his mind, he had this idea that he would be a good teacher and would be good for the kids. And so that, that was the end that he pursued as he went to, to school there and got his teaching certificate. And after he, he finished college, the family headed north to Salmon which I think was by design was where mom and dad wanted to end up and, and raise their family. So that's uh, in 1969, we ended up in Salmon and dad became a teacher in the seventh for the seventh grade in Brooklyn junior high. And um, some of you old timers will, will remember him as a teacher. I had him in the seventh and eighth grade. He taught social studies. One of the things that all of us kids understood quite well in his class was that if you could get him talking about the old days, the stories of being a police officer and, and uh, some of those things, that he would get to talking and pretty soon all of the class time would be taken up in good stories. It was very entertaining, but we wouldn't have to do any work. And so, uh, Occasionally, when we got all together as students, we would say, hey, who's going to get Mr. Hicks talking? Somebody would volunteer, and, and uh, so that's how it went. And I think all the kids understood that. And we were better for it because we had some great stories. And um, I guess if you look at it from that perspective, you learn stuff from stories. And, and dad had kind of a way of saying, and this is the, you know, the moral of the story is this. Don't speed. Or, or uh, you know, don't steal. Or don't do this or do that. Mind your parents. Do what they ask. Things like that. So, um, as a... As a teenager, growing up in, in Mike Hicks's home, we all learned of there were, there were a few expectations. One of them, probably the, the primary expectation, was that we didn't mouth off our mother. We had to honor her and respect her, and, and part of that was not talking back or getting mad and yelling at her or something. And... Um, the dynamics of our family, I was number two, as far as the, the order of the kids. So I had an older brother, Mike. And Mike was a good example in, on many occasions of what not to do. And so I would just observe and take mental note of certain things. And, and uh, one of them 
was what happens when you mouth off at mom. Because I remember that happening one day. I, I remember it very well. In fact, Mike and I, uh, I was about 10 years old. So Mike would have been 12. And we had just gone down and, and gotten our football gear. Because football season was about to start. And Mike had gone downstairs and put on his gear to, to see how it all fit. As, as you always do, make sure you get your pants fitting correctly and nothing looks stupid on you. And uh, mom asked Mike to do something and he lipped off at her and, and then dad came unglued. Now I was on the way down to milk the cows, so I wasn't in the house, but I heard the ruckus and the yelling and knew something had gone wrong. And someone was getting in trouble. And after listening to the sounds for two seconds, I realized it was my older brother. So I went on down and finished milking, thinking, man, I'm glad I'm not in the house right now. Sounds like dad's pretty mad about something. <laughs> and so I finished up and went back in. And, and my brother was sitting down in his bedroom, kind of licking his wounds and, and uh, moping around a little bit. and. Uh, and I overheard dad come down. So this would have been, you know, 45 minutes after, after the war. And, uh, and, and the things were, had quieted down and dad went in and talked to my brother. And I heard him say, say, I'm sorry for getting so angry at you and disciplining you in such a harsh manner. But nobody talks to to my wife, the way that you talked to, to her. And, um, and that's, that's how it was. And they had a little talk there and I overheard the, the talking and, uh, and, and the little lesson, like I said, dad always had a little lesson. He said, okay, Mike, what would you do if, Somebody talk to your girlfriend at school the way that you just talked to your mom. Mike, you know, his response was, well, I'd beat the hell out of him. Dad said, well, okay. That's kind of how it is here. Your mother's, your mother's my sweetheart, and I'm not going to allow you to talk to her that way. And so Mike understood. He figured it out. And uh, then that's how it was in our house. And so, like I said, I learned that you don't lip off at mom. Now, I had my own moments where mom and I got into some heated conversations with dad there. And, uh, and but thankfully, um, it wasn't uh, to the point where I think dad felt like he needed to intervene, thankfully. So uh, dad was the type of educator that, that he felt the need to address uh, kids' specific needs. And, and I think he was, he was the kind of person that, um, that didn't want any student to, to fail while he was involved on any level. Now, we all understand that failure is a part of life, and we grow from our failures. But I'm talking about the point where he could help a kid by intervening and in, in, in creating some kind of situation to help the kid out. For example, I remember in my class, there was um, a couple of kids that, that needed help. And uh, dad created little programs for them specifically so that they could finish their education or at least continue their education at home because school wasn't working out for them. I remember one kid decided to quit school and go to work or do whatever. And, and dad noticed he hadn't showed up at school for a week or so. So he called his mom. His mom said, oh, yeah, 
he's decided to quit and he's going to get a job and go into the workforce. And so dad went down uh, to the kid's house, knocked on the door and had a little visit with them and, um, and said, listen, you're not going to give up on school. And here's the reason, because you're the kind of individuals that can go a long ways in life with an education behind you. And, um, and I really feel like you need to be back in class. And I know it's not easy and, and things are, are tough at school, but, but come back and we can make this work out. And so the kid did, he took his advice and came on back to school and finished and graduated and, uh, and had a solid career in his life. And that was just an example of, of the way dad would intervene and, and try to help people out. And it was, it was a lifesaver for some kids and for his own kids. Um, he took a similar approach. I mean, you know, he had eight kids and um, some of us uh, had our own ideas about how we wanted to do things in life. And, and dad, generally speaking, was okay with that. He'd give us counsel and advice, um, usually when we asked for it. But as kids growing up in his house, um, we heard all of his philosophies about life and about how people are able to get things done and here's how that works. And a lot of the, the setting for um, his teaching and extolling his philosophies was hunting during the time we were hunting and fishing, we'd be out there casting our lines in and in the fishing. And he would start talking about things, life and stories and things like that, that we could, we could grow from and hunting hunting is a whole different story dad was one of those people that thought he had to walk all over the country to find the deer he didn't let the deer come to him he would go to the deer and you know i don't know what my brother thought about that but i hated hiking and walking especially with a rifle Guns get heavy when you pack them around all day long. Even if you have a decent sling and you're, it's slung over your shoulder, it's still heavy. And you're climbing up over rocks and walking through the sagebrush and up mountains and down the other side. I didn't like walking. And I knew that dad, at least once or twice every hunting season, was going to walk a long ways. For example, one year when I was about oh, 14, I suppose, I was maybe 15, um, I had just gotten my new rifle, really nice um, German-made uh, six with a Mauser action. It was really nice. And uh, anyway, which was actually a pretty light gun. It wasn't that heavy compared to Dad's, that old, Army surplus 30 out six he carried, weighed about 10 pounds. I don't know how he packed that around. But anyway, dad wanted to walk from the top of, of Williams Creek down to the drainage we lived in, the one one canyon over in Prow Creek. So mom dropped us off up there at the top, and we walked all day down to home. That's where we walked clear home. And um, the first 100 yards was fine. But then, you know, it got hard. <laughs> Hiking's not easy when you're in steep, rough terrain. And I didn't like that. I figured anywhere that you couldn't drive to wasn't the place that you needed to be. But that's how dad operated. And, um, and while we were walking along, um, he was quietly 
visiting and talking to Mike and I. And perhaps in looking back on that, dad wasn't um, wanting to kill any deer that day. He just wanted to spend time with his boys and tell them stories and, and um, talk about some of his philosophies. And now dad is retired. He's been retired now for close to 15 years. And, uh, and he's, you know, done a lot of the same things he did before, except go to work. Mom still makes him do stuff around the house or encourages him strongly. And he usually does what she asks. <clears throat> but every time I visit dad and, and, uh, and spend time talking with him about not only the old times, but the current times. He always has a lesson. Uh, and maybe he doesn't frame it in that context necessarily, but he always has something good to say about things. In good meaning, there's a lesson in this. That's kind of, because dad's a natural educator, that's kind of the way he, he forms his his dialogue and i find it kind of interesting and it's fun to be around him because he always has a good story and it's not like he's pounding um information into everybody's minds and trying to teach them something but he's one of those people that just teaches naturally there's just always something um you can learn from what he's talking about and so anyway, that's a little bit about my dad and uh, where we all came from. I, I have a rich heritage and I appreciate all that dad has taught me and my brothers, and sisters, and all the other kids that he's taught uh, through school. And, um, and so dad, happy Father's Day. I hope that things go well and that you you can have another memorable day we love and appreciate you thanks for listening growing up in idaho the good old days 